Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest episode of This Is Why We Stand. I am your host, Joe Archino, and we are truly honored to be here at the Lanza Family Center for All Ages. Tremendous hosts, and we are really having a great time with the show today. We have Tom Georgie here with us once again. Tom is a regular fate. Everybody is always re ready for you to come on the air, but we do really appreciate your commitment, Tom. I mean, you, we've learned so much from you each time, you know, we always kind of go over different topics. Of course, we've all we've really hit so much with you, but you always add so much to the program, and we truly appreciate you always making time for us. I'm sure by now everybody realizes that I'm a ham, and uh, <laughs> have, you know, be, uh, being in the in the uh, music industry and the entertainment field, you know, I, I love doing this <laughs> thing. So, you know, believe me, it, it's it's my pleasure, you know, to do these shows uh, for a number of reasons, not just that. Well, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I think you just are so open and always teach us so much and you have so much knowledge that you just always make us learn and think about things differently. And that's one of the reasons I thought it was perfect to have you on for this program especially. This is a season, we're in December, we're getting close to Christmas. It's a time for gratitude to really remember why we're here and for the, the reason we can, oh, can all be with our families on Christmas and sitting around the tree opening presents is because people such as yourself were away from your families at time protecting our country. And, you know, I, I think certainly for you, maybe you can take us back to what that was like being in Vietnam, away from your family. Uh, I'm sure not an easy thing by any means. Yeah, well, f uh, fortunately, uh, I left the uh for Vietnam on the 31st, I, fl I flew out of uh, you know Kennedy, San Francisco, uh, Oakland Army Terminal, uh, and then uh, left for uh, Vietnam. I think uh, we crossing the international date line. I'm not exactly sure, but I know I arrived in Saigon on the 5th of uh, of April, uh, 1966, and uh, my first holiday away from my family was Easter Sunday. And that was always held at our house. Uh, we spent uh, Christmas uh, with my mother's side of the family and Thanksgiving and Easter with my father's side of the family. But we held, we held Easter dinner. So I knew that, you know, not being there, I, I was going to miss that terribly because I grew up with that and, and, and loved the holiday and loved my family. So it, it was really hard. And like I showed you that picture, that was uh, uh, Easter services uh, for me, uh, April 66. And, Believe me, it was really heartbreaking you know, being away from my family. Uh, you know, it, it was a, it was a, a miserable, miserable Easter Sunday. But uh, some of us uh, made it uh, made it a little bit better because I had gotten a package, uh, you know, from home uh, shortly after I arrived, and it contained a can of pineapple. Uh, one of the guys broke into the mess tent and stole a can of spam. So we cooked that up, and I put the pineapple out, and we, we made ourselves a little uh, impromptu uh, Easter dinner, uh, you know, which, uh, which, you know, made the day a little bit more enjoyable for all of us. But being separated, uh, you know, is, is really, it's really a lousy thing, and it, it really hurts so bad. Christmas, I was home for, and uh, I didn't expect to be. Uh, getting wounded and being sent home, uh, you know, uh, earlier, I did not have to spend Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, you know, away from the family. And uh, w when I got home and my uh, grandmother, uh, who was the only grandmother I knew because my father's parents died before I met them, you know, she came to uh, St. Albans to visit me. Uh, they wouldn't bring her the first day. They wanted to see what I looked like. They brought her the second day because she was elderly. And, you know, she sat next to my bed. I get a little choked up even just thinking about it. And she said, I pray to God to send you home for Christmas. You know, not this way, though. I didn't want you to come home this way, but, but I wanted you home for Christmas, and God answered my prayers. I'm just sorry that you had to get hurt. But uh, I, I was home for Christmas, and, uh, you know, uh, thank God for that because, I, you know, that was a big holiday for me and for the family. And, you know, if I was in country uh, uh, away from them on, on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, it would have really driven me crazy because that's one of the things being in Vietnam We were a day ahead with the international date line. So so when it was when it was uh, Saturday night, you know in Vietnam, it was Friday night back home. I knew what everybody was doing back home You know, I knew it was Friday night I knew where all my friends were going to be, you know, and how badly I wished I could be there with them 
So same thing for holidays. You know, I, I knew what was going on on, on certain you know, holidays and what I would have been missing. So thank God for, you know, small favors. Uh, I was told I got the million dollar wound because uh, I would live to tell the story uh, and get out of the war. And that's why it's called a million dollar wound because it's uh, worth a million dollars to, you know, get out of the war and live to tell about it. So uh, I'm happy I made it home for Christmas and, uh, you know, uh, like I said, Easter was uh, was hard for me, but I got through it somehow. And then there was Fourth of July. Uh, I would actually I was in I was in the hospital on Fourth of July, and that was another big holiday for our family. You know, we used to all get together. My uncle worked for a private girls' school in Greenwich, and he had the run of the whole place. And you know, he had a little, little cottage on the grounds of the Greenwich Academy, and we used to all meet there for a huge clam bake on the Fourth of July, and that always. You know, somebody always towards the end of the day would get a water pistol out and squirt somebody, <laughs> and then, you know, another one would get one. And, you know, by the end of the day, we were dragging out garden hoses and buckets of water, and, you know, we'd all be laughing, laughing ourselves silly, but we would be drenched, you know, with water, but we were having the time of our lives. And, you know, I was, I was laying in the hospital uh, on uh, July 4th, which was actually uh, July 3rd back home, now on July 5th. I flew uh, out of uh, Quinyon going to Clark Air Force Base, not knowing I was going home. I didn't find this out until I got to Clark Air Force Base. I, they didn't tell me where I was going. They just said, you're going to Clark Air Force Base. I figure I'm going there, I'm going to get patched up, and I'm going to get sent back to my unit. Because every place I wound up when I first got, the first hospital I wound up in, from battalion aid to brigade, every place, you want us to notify your family? You want us to notify? I said, no, don't anybody send any telegrams. Like my mother is under a doctor's care. Anybody comes there, she's going to have a heart attack and drop dead in the door. We said, don't do that. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, hard uh, in, 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 in many ways uh, being away from the family, knowing, uh, like I said, uh, I always knew what was going on back home. And you, you think of that when you're, uh, when you're separated. From your loved ones and your friends, uh, you, you want to be there so badly, and, and you're, uh, you know, you're you're in this uh, horrible situation, which combat is. It is, and you know, you've you've talked about that so much that I never forget that story about you know them them coming up to you and you telling them about your mother because you just knew if what happened if she got that news, and it's just so incredibly powerful. And I think it it really shows people at home what it's all about. You know why we can't take for granted how lucky we are. Uh, but Tom, people have gotten to know you a little bit, and I know I want to extend this a little bit so we can get to know you a little bit better. But I think one of the funny things I thought for the holidays we could do was you know your favorite. Christmas present you ever got you know I is it as an adult I know you got a lot of hobbies I you invited me to come down to your man cave which is one of the coolest setups I've ever seen you've got a great museum you know is it was it as a kid was it as an adult favorite Christmas present you ever got favorite, it's got to be Christmas 1957 when I got my first set of drums okay it's got to be that because I started playing <laughs> drums my mother tells me when I was four years old banging on pots and pans you know, <laughs> with spoons on the floor. Then they bought me a toy d drum set. And, you know, my mother uh, had a pretty good voice. And, you know, she would she would sing Christmas songs, you know, and I would, I would play drums behind her, give her a little beat and stuff. And as I grew older and older and older, I told them I wanted to take lessons. I wanted to play the drums, you know, and I started taking lessons uh, uh, in 57, actually, uh, or, you know, early in the year. So naturally when Christmas rolled around, you know, they said, well, what do you want for Christmas? And there was a music store in Porchester. It was called Carl Erka's Music on North Main Street. And I said, well, there's this beautiful red and black set of Gretsch drums down there that I, that I would love to have that for Christmas. And, you know, I woke up Christmas morning and, uh, you know, they, they, were, uh, they were set up in my living room under the, under, under the tree. And uh, uh, around the corner from me was my best friend, uh, the late Kenny Munich, who played guitar. And the phone rings and it's Kenny and he says, I got a guitar, I got a guitar. And I'm screaming, I got drums, I got drums. <laughs> and he ran over with his guitar and the two of us are, you know, rock and rolling in my living room. Uh, we sounded terrible, but, you know, we were having the time <laughs> of our lives and, 
yeah, that's that's got to be my all-time favorite. That's pretty right. cool. And, you know, for people, people know you so much from your military stories, but you're you've been a rock and musician for a long time a long now. Time. That that passion yeah. from you said from four years old banging on on mom's pots and pans <laughs> in the kitchen right. to today, you you still keep still on going playing, strong. Still playing, still playing. You know, I'm in, in a nine-piece band right now. I also play with a trio or a quartet, depending on how many I can get together. So yeah, I, I'm gonna keep playing. Uh, you know, there, there's a saying that, that, that goes, uh, you know, I stopped playing drums because because I got old. And they say, no, you got old because you stopped stop playing, playing drums. Mm. And I, I intend mm. to never stop playing drums because music is what keeps me young. And, you know, uh, I mean, Louis Belson played drums until he was 83, 85 years old. Uh, uh, who was he married to? Pearl Bailey? I can't remember. But anyway, and he was a great, great drummer. And Buddy Rich, uh, I mean, he died in his late 70s. Uh, you know, he abused his body a lot, probably could have lived longer. But anyway, you know, there are some drummers that, that have played in, you know, the you know, very uh, uh, later years of their lives. And I, I hope that at 85, I'm still playing drums. I believe it's uh, 10 years from now. And I hope, I'm, <laughs> I hope I'm there. And I hope I'm still sitting behind a set of drums. But uh, the, With your spirit, my friend, I think you absolutely will. I hope so. I'm going to try my best, that's for sure. But it's like we said, you know, it's it's just always so great to have you on and talk. I mean, this was a topic that I thought was really important, and it's something we really haven't touched on yet. Is those challenges of being deployed, and to hear it from you, and, and to kind of just relive it, you know. And that's why I think you're such a good storyteller, where you're open and you're willing to to share things that are not always easy to talk about. Right, right. But like you said before, and you know, kind of going back to our last guest, which was very, I think, important, you know. He was talking a lot about PTSD and a lot of the things, the work he's doing to try to help veterans coming back today. And I never forget what you said. You know, it, it's not, it's not that people are weak or anything like that. It's just that they don't talk about what they went through, and that is something that is that is really going to harm you. If you bottle all that stuff up, it's going to just destroy you. Right. And you said you when you came back, you knew right away. I have to talk about this, or else it's just going to destroy me. And you you luckily had those people you could talk about it with right. but though that's one of those lessons i've heard p feedback from people who've said you know how much it helped them to hear that so you, all the things that you communicate and you relay are so important it's so important you know there, there there's a thing that it's called a thousand yard stare <clears throat> and I, I meant to bring the book with me it's uh right town uh veterans which no longer exists because the guy that started it passed away but it it's uh, it's got a picture of a guy and he's got that blank stare and uh, it's also got the story of the Willow Street Boys. Uh, you, from from you know, Porchester, yeah, absolutely. I, I'll try to copy that book somehow for you because it's a great little book. It's got the, 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 the street diagram where they lived on the street. But uh, uh, hold on, I try, try to think what, where I was going with this. But uh, yeah, anyway, I, I have it and I didn't even know it. But you know, my wife pointed it out to me. I was talking to a friend of mine and after we left the conversation was over with she said Tommy she says you know you spoke to that friend of yours for 10 minutes you never once made eye contact with him and I said you know Barb I said I know I do that and I don't know why I do that and that's all part of the thousand yard stare and I didn't find out until years later when I started being evaluator for PTSD and started going to group counseling and speaking to doctors about it this is why I say it's so important you got to get this stuff out because you'll learn things about the disease. Well, I don't know what to even call it a disease, about the uh, uh, syndrome or whatever you want to call it. I did not know that not making eye contact is all part of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and, you know, like I said, I don't ever remember doing that growing up until after the war. This is when it all started. And I knew I was doing it, and I didn't know why I was doing it. And like I said, Barbara pointed it out to me. And then I was told later on when I heard about it in counseling and with psychiatrists talking to them, they said that that's all part of it. And I still do it to this day. I'm not looking in your eyes right now as I'm talking. I'm looking off over there. It's just something I can't control, and it's all part of post-traumatic <laughs> stress disorder. So once again, tell everybody. You gotta go and speak to the professionals. You cannot come back from combat. It's such an, you know, it, this, let's look, you go to combat, you look into the gates of hell. You literally, when you're in the SHIT and you're, you know, involved in that type of, uh, you know, environment and lifestyle for however long, 
you see things that, that are going to be with you for the rest of your life. And these are things that are not easy to process and they're not easy to deal with. You cannot try to do it yourself. And like I told you before, and I told my mother this when she told me, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. I said, Ma, I have got to talk about this. You cannot keep what I saw bottled up inside of me. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to explode. And that, I always felt, helped me just to, you know, anybody asked me a question, well, what, what, what happened? Well, I, would, I would tell them, you know, I would tell them. You know, what was I going to say? I don't want to talk about it. That's the wrong thing. You know, you got to talk about it. And a lot of guys make that mistake. They don't, and then they pay the price, you know. And unfortunately, we have a very high suicide rate, you know, with PTSD, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> veterans. And maybe if more of them sought professional help, you know, th those numbers would, would, would diminish considerably. And uh, this is why I, I keep telling everybody, well, the guys coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, the Middle East, Syria, wherever they're <clears throat> deployed, Please, you know, don't, don't come back and be a hero. You, you just go talk to the pros, you know, and get the help you need. If you got to be on medication, be on medication. You know, whatever. What, do whatever you need to help keep your mind healthy. And, and you know, and, and you'll hopefully live a productive, you know, and semi-normal semi -normal life. Your life's never going to be completely normal. You know, that's another thing you got to realize and face. Because there's so many things that are tied into being in combat, and it's not just the shooting, it's the separation. That's the thing I was, you know, most troubled by, is being separated, like I told you, from family and friends. Because I always knew what everybody was doing back home, and I wanted to be there so badly, but I knew I was stuck here for a year, and I had to deal with it somehow. And, you know, every week, month that goes by, I don't know if it gets easier or whether you just learn to, to live with it a little bit better, but boy, oh boy, that really, really bothered me. And just reading about things in the Stars and Stripes on how, you know, the people at home were so against the war and so non-supportive of us, these things really bothered the Vietnam vet. And thank God, you know, the, 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 uh, the fighting force of today, our military today, you know, doesn't get that type of treatment. You know, they're revered and they're treated as heroes when they come back as they should be. And uh, if that's because the Vietnam, uh, you know, had to uh, <clears throat> pay the price for them, you know, for them to get the accolades that they deserve, well, so be it. You know, I'll, I'll you know, I'll take that gladly. And uh, uh, I hope that everybody that marches off to war gets to march home again and holds their chest out and their head high. And they certainly deserve it. You know, Tom, that sacrifice, I think, is what makes the Vietnam veteran even more so special in American history. But, uh, Tom, really appreciate you coming down today. We wish you and your loved ones a very Merry Christmas. And I'm sure, I know in the new year ahead, you're going to be back sitting right here. We're going to learn even more from you. But it always really is a pleasure, Tom. Thank you so much for your time, as always. And it's always a pleasure for me to be here. You know that, Joe. Thank you got you it. So Thank Merry you, my Christmas friend. You you. Merry Christmas, buddy. And we'll see you soon. Merry Christmas.